One of the great privileges I've had over the years is to engage with many different countries and cultures, with all the richness uh, that it brings. And one of the questions that I'm often asked is how and why does the United Kingdom Parliament operate in the way that it does? How do we conduct our parliamentary affairs in the business of lawmaking? The United Kingdom Parliament is often referred to as the mother of parliaments. But how do we seek to make our government more accountable for its policies and actions? In a world where the role of parliaments will increase, I believe that we have an interesting story to tell. There are variations of this theme, but ultimately it is about a process of transparency and accountability to the people, built on the ideas and endeavours of individual parliamentarians. It is these individuals acting as representatives of the people that drive Parliament on and help it to retain relevance. Those with decision-making responsibilities and parliamentarians from wherever they may be around the world, civil society, tomorrow's leaders and the young of today may find aspects of this production of interest. The United Kingdom Parliament is made up of three main parts. The House of Commons, which is the primary chamber composed of elected representatives. The House of Lords, the appointed chamber charged with amending and revising legislation. And the monarch, who is the head of state. The building that houses the United Kingdom Parliament is officially called the Palace of Westminster and the oldest parts date back to the 11th century. It is from these origins, when the building symbolized the divine right of the monarch to reign, that Parliament has evolved over many hundreds of years into the institution it is today. The origins of the UK's parliamentary system stretch way back uh, across the centuries. The development of Parliament and parliamentary institutions was really characterised by a centuries-long battle between the executive in the shape of the king and the representatives of the people, initially, of course, on a, an incredibly narrow franchise, which was widened in the 19th century and then widened again substantially at the start of the 20th century. And that struggle has been the defining theme of the way in which Parliament today is what it is. Parliament in this country is, is well established, um, but the history has not exactly been smooth. The King brought Parliament into existence and at times uh, relied on Parliament for support, but throughout history there have been periods of conflict where the King asserted his, the divine right of kings to rule and Parliament resisted. So a special conflict, of course, during the, the Civil War, which was resolved in favour of uh, Parliament. But for a period, the, the monarchy was abolished indeed for a short time, the House of Lords was abolished. With the Restoration in 1660, things were put back to what they'd been previously. But there was still conflict between King and Parliament leading uh, to further almost revolution in 1688, 1689, uh, resolved by the King James II actually fleeing and being replaced by William Orange and his wife Mary, who was um, James's daughter. Um, but they took the throne on condition that they accepted what became the Bill of Rights, which asserted that the King could not legislate on his own, in other words, he could not pass law without the assent of Parliament. And really, the parliamentary system we have today derives from 1688-89, so that that established the supremacy of Parliament over the monarch. Parliament is rich in history, and its continuity has been a great strength. But how does that weight of history impact the way Parliament conducts its affairs in the 21st century? We are a people who grasp the importance of symbolism and history. And we don't do it simply because of through weakness or nostalgia or conservatism. We do it because it holds our nation together. It's like a web. It holds us together, each and every one of us together, and it holds our country together. And it is good that we have some of the traditions and symbolism of past years. For example, the state opening of Parliament by the Queen 
uh, in the House of Lords. It's not the Queen's address, it is the government's address, the government's legislative programme that she enunciates there. In the House of Commons, on the green carpet, there are two red stripes in front of the front bench, each front benches. They are two sword lengths and a foot away. So that in the old days, members would get out their swords on guard. They would be unhappy about parleying, about talking, and they'd get a bit rough with each other. And so we have this symbolism, the symbolism of the Speaker's procession every day through the central lobby, in, most importantly, carrying the mace. The mace is the symbol of a, a the monarch in Parliament. These are traditions which we still cling to, and I, I know full well from my experience that these are the traditions that the people of this country like to cling to and, and certainly enjoy. The question is as on the order paper. As many as I have that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. So how does Parliament go about its work, be it reform or proposing and passing new legislation? The government of the day, drawn from the political party, with the majority of MPs after an election, or a coalition of parties, seeks to drive the country forward using its own legislative agenda. The government runs the country. Parliament acts as a check and a scrutiny body on the people who run the country. There is a very clear distinction between parliament and government, not as clear as in the United States. In the United States, they have the separation of powers. It's a fundamental doctrine. The president can't be in Congress, nor can any members of his government, uh, but nor can Congre individual senators or congressmen uh, be members of an American cabinet. We don't use that system. It's a very different system, but we still draw a distinction uh, because although the members of the government are members of parliament, uh, Parliament is far more than just those MPs who are ministers. At any one time there are a maximum of 70 or 80 members of Parliament who are in the government, but there are almost 600 who aren't. So if Parliament disagrees with the government, then Parliament can, as it has done on many occasions over the years, refuse to go along with what the government wishes. At the end of the day, the government is the servant of Parliament, not the other way around. Parliamentarians with their areas of expertise and interest, are the crucial actors in this process, as they scrutinise the work of the government, representing their party and constituents. The MPs in the House of Commons have a dual role, both representing their constituents and acting as legislators. MPs have the power to advocate and represent on behalf of those who have little power themselves, their constituents working and living in their constituency. But MPs also have the power to formulate the legislation, to make the laws and to determine the priorities for government, including the spending priorities and what the country does internationally. Some backbenchers focus entirely on Parliament, so they see their role as being elected by their constituents in order to represent them in Parliament, and they focus on holding the government to account, scrutinising legislation, and they spend a lot of time in Parliament. At the other end of the spectrum, you get MPs who are backbenchers who see their role as being local community campaigners, who are what we call good constituency MPs, and they spend a lot of time in their constituencies raising local issues and dealing with them locally. Um, and I think, to my mind, a good backbencher actually combines those two roles and uses Parliament in order to raise the issues that really matter to their, their constituents locally. They seek to influence MPs by writing to their members of Parliament on issues of importance to them. They could be policy issues, not just about domestic policy, but their concerns, for example, about what is happening in other parts of the world, like the Middle East. They can ring up MPs' offices and pass on their comments to a Member of Parliament before a crucial vote in the Commons. Or they could see Members of Parliament in their surgeries, the weekly opportunity that we have to talk to our constituents if they want to raise with us individual cases or matters of policy. 
These are answers to oral questions that have been sent to me by ministers. Every MP can submit uh, an oral or a written question and the minister has to reply either in the chamber or in writing. And these are examples of answers that ministers have given back to me. I submit lots of questions. It's one way that an MP can hold the government to account and really get to the bottom of certain issues that you can't always raise in the chamber. Arrangements for the House of Lords are very different, as the House of Lords is the unelected revising chamber. The question is that this bill do now pass. As many as are of that opinion will say content. While a small number are made up of hereditary or religious representatives, the majority of peers are appointed to the House of Lords for their expertise in one or more areas. The usual role of a second chamber is to revise laws and to scrutinise them in some detail and also to some extent to hold the government to account. And the House of Lords um, in, in the UK is a chamber which does precisely that. It uh, does it through various means. It asks questions of the government on a daily basis and something like in the past year for which we have figures, something like seven and a half thousand questions were asked of ministers in the government. We have debates in the House of Lords which are on topics of general interest. We have committee work which means that every single law is looked at in enormous detail, every line, every comma is, is, is looked at. Um, the important thing perhaps to remember in the House of Lords, unlike in the House of Commons, is that there is time to do this because we have no time limit on our debates. I think too it is important to point out that the House of Lords fulfills an enormously important function um, of bringing to bear expertise on laws which very often are highly technical. Any member of our House can bring forward an issue that they wish to have discussed or debated. They can uh, ask a question, they can put that question either in written form, in which case the government has to answer it, or they can put it in oral form, in which case it can be debated. They can bring forward a private member's bill. They can ask for issues uh, to be discussed by way of an amendment. So if a bill is coming through and something is uh, uh, not agreed to by that member, they can bring forward the amendment and have it considered by the House and then there will be a vote at the end of the debate where the House can determine whether they agree with that position or disagree. The big power that we have in the House of Lords is really to make the government think again. Either to just stop and give us more time to look at legislation or occasionally, particularly if we're coming up to the end of the year, or coming up to the end of the Parliament when there's going to be a general election. Uh, in those circumstances, the House of Lords can say, hang on, we don't think that you've got this quite right. We want you to think again. And particularly if it's at the end of a Parliament or at the end of the parliamentary year, uh, time is against the government. So we can use that time to pressurise the ministers to think very carefully about what they're doing. That's our big power, a power of delay. The government does not agree with the committee's conclusions. Now, people may ask, well, why should the House of Lords exist? Why should you have a chamber with any power at all if it's not elected? And that's a perfectly good question, but there's also, I think, quite a good answer. Uh, that you need in any parliament to get the best results for the country as a whole, uh, the, the proper balance between democratic accountability but also uh, a large number of parliamentarians who are not primarily constrained by the political party they belong to but are able, because of their background, having been successful uh, in business and in industry and in the arts and law or politics or whatever, are able to make a personal contribution. And as long as the elected chamber has the last word, even if it's only after a year or so, uh, then I, uh, we feel that that balance is being properly maintained. In the old days, uh, the House of Lords was as powerful as the House of Commons. If you couldn't persuade the House of Lords, then they effectively had a right of veto. 
Uh, that progressively became more unacceptable throughout the 20th century because they are not and have not been an elected chamber and therefore at the end of the day they're not a democratic assembly. Uh, so what we have now is a situation where the House of Lords, the most it can do is delay legislation uh, for up to up two, one or two years. That's quite a power to have that power because sometimes the government is anxious to get legislation on the statute book and if the House of Lords is uh, disagreeing or blocking it, uh, then compromises have to be reached that are acceptable. Bills come to the House of Commons uh, predominantly. Uh, they are looked at in various stages, but perhaps not in their entirety. And then they reach the House of Lords. So the House of Lords is not duplicating what the Commons does. It is actually going over some aspects of bills which may not have been looked at at all. The House of Lords is, if you like, supportive in that the House of Lords scrutinises advises and makes changes, if possible, to the amendments that come from the House of Commons. The House of Lords is not a, is not a, a law-making body. It is a scrutinising, it is an advisory body, and it advises the Commons on some of the legislation that goes through the Commons in an attempt to improve it. And often, when a bill is being discussed in the Commons, comes to the Lords, the Lords makes some amendments to it, hopes to make improvements to it, then it goes back to the Commons, that bill, to look at again. Many times, the Commons approve of what the Lords have done and will accept the amendments. Many times, they will not. So they change it back again. Comes back again to the Lords, the Lords will look at it again. But at the end of the day, when you've had this toing and froing and the improvement of legislation, the Commons has its say, because the Commons is the supreme authority, it is the elected authority. But the relationship is there in this uh, bicameral chamber, bicameral parliament, and this is how it should be. Parliamentarians are the agents of scrutiny within the United Kingdom's parliamentary system. But how do they execute this crucial role and how much influence do they have? When a bill is introduced into Parliament, it goes through so many stages, both in the House of Lords where I sit and in the House of Commons. And in the House of Commons, a small committee will look at the detail line by line. And in the House of Lords, any single member of the House of Lords can propose an amendment to a bill and it has to be debated and looked at. So there are lots of opportunities to change the bill. Um, perhaps where that falls down is in most cases um, the government whips won't want to see too many changes to their bills and so quite often the government whips will say no we're voting against this but then have a look at it again and come back. Um, I took the energy bill through the House of Lords and a number of amendments I proposed were sort of not accepted by the government but they did think about it and come back later and change their own bill. So one way is on the floor of the chambers of both houses to propose amendments but a good way to get changes is to try to get hold of the minister, talk to the minister in detail, talk to the minister's civil servants and propose changes then. Working behind the scenes can often get more changes than on the floor of the house. Parliament on the whole holds government to account by, uh, by the party system, by having an opposition in the House of Commons and by uh, objecting to certain aspects of legislation and uh, voting on that legislation. And again, in the House of Commons, as, as you all know, and indeed will be said by all MPs, uh, they are elected and therefore they have the, the, the mandate to represent the wishes to some extent of their constituents. The House of Lords holds the government to account um, because it has various mechanisms of uh, asking the government to think again, whether that be through amendments to bills, whether it be through committee work, whether it be through direct questions or written questions to the government or debates. Uh, and the government always has to defend its policies in any of those different contexts. When the House sits, we start with question time. And, I mean, everybody sort of knows Prime Minister's question time, which happens on a Wednesday. They've suffered enough. Will the Prime Minister stop the messing about now and instruct the Justice Secretary to sack the incompetent Teesside coroner? Yeah, yeah. 
I will certainly look at the particular case that the Honourable Gentleman raises. Every single government department, and it's normally about once a month, has to answer questions in the House. It's very much like Prime Minister's questions, um, where the Secretary of State and all the ministers have to come before the House and they have to answer questions. And that actually has proved to be the best way of holding government to account. There are also written questions um, and you can write letters to ministers and they are obliged to respond. Um, you can also have freedom of information requests where if you don't think that a minister is really giving you the kind of detail that you want, you can have a freedom of information request to find out specific details. Um, so these are very important ways of holding government to account. But actually it is through having parties that are not the government um, looking at legislation in detail in committees the normally in public bill committees or at select committees looking in detail at the legislation that government is bringing forward and making objections or asking the government to clarify exactly why it is that they want to introduce something and not something else What is the job of the opposition? It is to constructively to oppose. The opposition, after all, has lost the election. The government has been elected and its manifesto has therefore been preferred to that of the other party. And there is an unwritten rule in Parliament that a government is entitled to get its business but that doesn't mean that opposition should not do everything they can to point out the flaws and the fallacies contained within the legislation placed before Parliament, the mistakes made by government in its conduct of foreign policy, because not all business is legislative, and as other such things. The role of the opposition, of course, is not always to oppose. It would be foolish to think that the opposition were there simply to oppose what the government wanted to do. The opposition is there to look carefully at the, what the government does want to do. And if it finds it's reasonable and they can support it, and it fits in with their policies and their philosophy, at least to give it that support. And if not, of course to oppose it, to speak out and to say that it, it, it can't go along with it. Uh, but to do it, of course, in a democratic manner. Always remember the phrase, um, opposition must have its say, but government must have its way. The invaluable scrutiny that parliamentarians perform would be impossible without an effective staff. They ensure the smooth running of operations and support for the work of parliamentarians. All MPs in the British Parliament are provided with an office in the Parliament are provided with computers, telephones and copying facilities within the Parliament. We're given research facilities, we're given a library available to us with library specialists able to assist us in more complex research of information. But in addition to this, we're also given finance to employ our own staff in order that we can do the research, we can do the representation in the way that we think best fits the needs of our local constituency and the needs of the country and therefore there's a wide array of resources made available all of which are available equally to all MPs. Most members of Parliament in the British Parliament will have three or four members of staff some working in Westminster inside the Parliament and some working in an office paid for by Parliament in their local constituency. While staff of MPs and peers can provide specific political support, parliamentary staff are invaluable in offering advice and assistance entirely devoid of political influence. But in terms of parliamentary activity, of course, there are all the frontline services like the, uh, the chamber itself, the advice which is given to the chair, to all members, government and opposition, from the clerks at the table dressed uh, as I am now, but with a, a wig and a gown on. Then there is all the services provided, uh, for example, in support of the legislative process. Uh, one of the great things, of course, is we are not civil servants. Um, we are servants of the legislature, not of the executive. And so that independence, whether one is serving a select committee or one of our um, really top-grade researchers 
uh, deconstructing unemployment statistics, they're not doing it under any ministerial direction, they're doing it for the House of Commons. And that independence and that political impartiality is actually absolutely central to everything that we do. While MPs and peers are scrutinising the activities of government, who is scrutinising the work of MPs and peers? A transparent and accountable system is imperative in ensuring that light is shone on all the activities of Parliament in order to retain the confidence of the citizens of the United Kingdom. All parliamentary committees and Parliament itself is fully televised, allowing the general public live and recorded access to all the goings on, all the debates, all the decisions in Parliament. But additionally, newspapers, radio, television and new media have access to Parliament in order to be able to talk with MPs, interview MPs, give MPs a platform for their views and also to hold MPs accountable for the things that they've done and for the votes they've participated in. Parliament ensures its work is transparent by recording every single thing that a Member of Parliament or a Minister says. It's through a document called Hansard, which is a verbatim account of every single deliberation in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It also covers the work of our committees, including select committees, so in this way, people are very clear exactly what Members of Parliament are saying. MPs are held accountable by a parliamentary scrutiny committee, but also by an independent regulator of MPs' behaviour and actions. And that combined with the freedom of information legislation, which gives access to the correspondence of MPs in their parliamentary duties and MPs' finances with regard to their parliamentary duties, gives individuals in their constituencies, gives pressure groups, gives the media the opportunity to ask questions in order to hold MPs accountable for their actions. The Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards is an entirely independent official. Uh, I can't direct him. Um, he, he makes up his own mind and reaches his own judgments on any complaints about the conduct of a member that may be made to him. And then he reports to the Committee on Standards and Privileges, which considers his report, and if some sort of penalty is thought by them to be appropriate, they will report as in, in those terms to the House, and it'll then be for the House to decide whether to impose that penalty or not. Journalists are free, as indeed anybody is, to uh, contact a uh, member of the House of Lords and uh, ask them about what is happening in the chamber, seek their views and, uh, and request interviews. I was always very much in favour of the broadcasting of Parliament. A number of members were not. I think there's a transparency there and I bless uh, the parliamentary channel. I think it's a wonderful way that people in this country are getting to know what goes on in both houses. But there's also transparency in that, of course, uh, Parliament itself is open to the public. We have public galleries, they must be allowed in there. At all our committees, whether it is legislative committees, committees that are dealing with legislation as it goes through the House, they are open to the public. The select committees, uh, they are also open to the public. When select committees are examining very important people on a particular issue, it is open for the public to see. It is as transparent as we could possibly make it. Um, there may be other methods that we can use as time goes by, but we are constantly wanting to make certain that the people of this country and, the, uh, and internationally know precisely what we are doing and that our door is wide open to allow them to do so. Parliament is a public building and members of the public are free to come to Parliament. They can meet with their MP or a peer to seek a resolution to a problem or attempt to influence. Charities, campaigning groups and commercial interests also seek to influence parliamentarians by lobbying for their point of view. Well, members of Parliament are elected to represent their local constituents. I have over 70,000 people that I'm meant to look after. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to agree with everything our constituents tell us. We have to make our own judgments. But of course, at the end of the day, a politician is elected to serve their local constituency. So, of course, they have to represent the views of the people that elected them. Otherwise, otherwise they probably won't get re-elected. Sometimes constituents, you know, they hold very different points of view. I mean, I'm a Labour MP. There are lots of voters who are conservative in the constituency. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them, but to me it's very important that they understand that even though I may not share their viewpoint, I still represent them. And so it's very important to me that I also go and see them and make the case for why it is that I'm not going to vote a certain way that they want me to vote. Lobbying is something that's going on all the time. Depends how you define lobbying. When I first entered Parliament in 1970, uh, I won't say lobbying was in its infancy, because lobbying goes back to the 19th century and before, but there was less organised lobbying. People would come to the central lobby of Parliament to lobby their members of Parliament on individual issues or on matters of social concern or on general issues of taxation or whatever. But it was... To say there was no orchestrated lobbying at that stage would be to tell the downright lie. Of course there was, but it was much less sophisticated and much less organised than it is now. There are now dozens of companies that depend upon lobbying for their very existence. There are all sorts of pressure groups and interest groups that employ professional lobbyists to work on their behalf and to seek to uh, capture the... Uh, uh, attention first and the support second of members of parliament and members of the House of Lords. Th th there is lobbying going on all the time on almost every subject. Now this is fine up to a point. We do have very strict rules of course about um, not being involved um, with any group where we are getting paid or where we are getting um, some privileges and then trying to push that cause in Parliament. Because obviously I think that would be seen to be corrupt and quite wrong. We have a book called the Register of Members' Interests where me every member of Parliament must put down the people who either support them financially or if they've got another job um, to put down very clearly what that job is and how many hours they spend on that job and how much money they're paid. Parliament's history brings great prestige. But there is constant pressure, both internal and external, to adapt and to develop to changing circumstances. This can be to consider both major and minor changes, such as extending voting rights or an amendment to parliamentary procedure. While this pressure does not lead to a constant state of flux, the way Parliament is composed and functions is a continual work in progress. Reform can be a slow but crucial aspect of the work of Parliament. Pressures for reform come from all sorts of directions and it's constant. Why shouldn't it be? Because as this country is changing over the years, so too what people expect from their Parliament is changing. We had a massive controversy a hundred years ago about whether women should have the right to vote and whether they should be in Parliament. Of course, in recent years, we had a woman Prime Minister in, in Margaret Thatcher, so that is a dramatic change, as have been the number of women members of Parliament in the House of Commons. And more recently, there have been similar pressures saying that Britain is, uh, of course, a country now of many ethnic groups, many people of different cultural, ethnic, uh, social backgrounds, Perhaps Parliament needs to be more representative of that diversity. And we have seen that in all the political parties now, when you look in the chamber, on both sides of the chamber, you'll see that uh, the people who are sitting there reflect the diversity of the country. Not perhaps entirely to the level required, but huge progress has been made in recent years in that direction. Pressures for reform of Parliament and its procedures come from many, many quarters. It come from Parliament itself, I remember well the days when I was a young backbencher here and uh, there was a, a very considerable move uh, to, uh, for select committees. Now, select committees are hugely important committees that go into the development and the wherewithal and what is happening in various government departments. They're very important. And there was a great deal of 
contention. They, it was a, uh, gr groups that didn't want to go, uh, to go that far. But we won through and we have now the select committee, so there is change that is made there, and that comes from Parliament itself. It comes from Parliament itself too, when we want to restrict the number of constituencies there are, therefore restricting the number of members of Parliament. Um, and it comes also from, the, uh, from outside, outside bodies, non-governmental organisations, from business and from industry. Change, it, we are by no means perfect, we have warts and all, but change is constant, it is constantly there and we examine it whatever quarter it comes from. The parliamentary system in the United Kingdom is a work in progress, requiring regular scrutiny. We are constantly looking at ways to improve, building on the positive and learning from negative experiences. I think the strengths of the UK parliamentary system, I almost answer this in the same breath as what are the weaknesses. Uh, and the real answer is that the system is as effective as its members want to make it. I think its strengths are that it is willing to change. It is willing to look at itself and say these things are not good enough. We must make some improvements, we must make progress. I hope you have enjoyed this production and that it has offered an insight into the way in which the United Kingdom Parliament operates. We all look forward to working together with you in the future as friends and colleagues.